welcome back to another stream of setting up Gen 2 on the HP X2 to 10 tablet. So last time, well actually it's been a while, <laughs> since I was quite busy setting up the uh, Cures of Might Magic 3, the Shadow of Death playthrough. Now we're done so we can do more of these streams. Uh, so I don't remember what I've been doing that much last time. Uh, I do know that I emerged the um, Plasma Mobile e-build that I made. And we also dealt with the quirks of the hardware itself. But I don't remember which ones exactly. Like, what did we set up last time that we didn't before? I know that we got the rotation working, we got the sound working. But, uh, yeah, I don't remember if I got anything else working during the last stream. However, in between, I figured some things out. And notably, it is about the back camera. Which is quite interesting, actually. Let me show that to you. If the thing actually works quickly enough. That's a bit strange that it's a bit sluggish. Um, the front camera worked out of the box, but the back camera... Well, we need to go into device drivers, and then we need to go to staging. And the thing is that there is this staging thing, media staging drivers. And this is what we need. Enable support for Intel MIPI camera drivers. Enable support for the Intel ISP2 camera interfaces and MIPI sensor drivers. And this is basically what it really is. Video Atom ISP. So yes, here if your platform supports Intel Atom system on a chip camera imaging subsystem. So yes, this is what we need. The hilarious thing is that the interface can have like a bunch of different sensors, so the cameras itself. There's also a helper library. And I basically made everything that sounded similar to what I have in the ASPI tables as modules. So hopefully this will give something. But also, the drivers are hilariously huge, like it's in staging because it is just insanely huge. And it even requires firmware, which I don't think is shipped in Linux firmware. And even if it has firmware and all of that code behind it, it still won't actually do anything decent, because in order for it to work, you also have to have Intel's specific library for processing, because the image by default is in some kind of weird format. So that's very strange. I have no idea why Intel decided that this was a good idea. Reportedly, it's made to work in uh, in Android more than it was made for Linux itself, or Windows for that matter. It does seem to work on Windows. <laughs> when I tried to use the webcam on Windows, it was very hilarious because at least uh, Edge, which was the only browser that actually managed to uh, be able to both show and transfer the stream of the webcam, it doesn't have any way to configure which camera you want to use. So by default it used the back camera, which is really silly. And in order to get the front camera to be selected, I had to disable the back camera <laughs> in the Windows options. That was very hilarious. But anyway, um, so what we are still missing in the kernel? Basically three things, I think. Maybe two things. The main thing is battery meter. And people on the kernel bug tracker have been asking questions and things like that, so looks like someone is looking into this issue. 
but it's still kind of like slow. I sent all the details that they asked for, but uh, I didn't get any reply, so that's a bit strange. And I am wondering if I can try and figure that out. Oh yeah, we also tried the Dollar Cove PMIC thing. Oh right, that's what we did last time, right. Uh, we got buttons working also. The uh, volume up and volume down buttons, which are pretty strange because as far as I can tell they're not like wired into the X subsystem so I can't really like rebind them or something they're always going to be volume up and volume down that's weird I'm not sure if I showed that also here in the configuration in order to get buttons working you need to enable uh, I I think it's like under HID. HID multi touch, ITE. Um, maybe not. Well, there's something about. Oh no, that's multifunction device, I think. Hi, Mark. Nice to see you here. Um, yeah, so my idea was that this should give me battery support. Because from what I can see in the ASU tables, I have an X Powers AXP battery. So this should work, but it doesn't. X Powers AXP series power management IC is controlled with I2C. Yes, this is exactly what it says. Core APIs. You have to select individual components like regulators or the PEK under the corresponding menus. Well, that's what I don't really get because where are the corresponding menus? And yes, I do have ASP op region and designware and designware and designware. So I'm not entirely certain if I have my configuration correct, but I also uploaded that to the kernel bug tracker, so it's like the kernel people, if they see a problem with that, they should tell me about it. The weird thing is that I don't see many other people saying much about their not being battery support. But I know that in Ubuntu, there definitely is no battery displayed. And in Android, there is also no battery displayed. At least in the Android versions that I was trying. So that's kind of weird. I don't know what is going on. On the other hand, uh, I do have a few ideas. One is that I only tried the baseline Android kernel for Android x86, and that didn't really work that well. And also for Remix OS. But there are also topic drivers for specifically Cherry Trail support. So one of the things I want to try is to compile an Android kernel with Cherry Trail support. And if that actually gives me battery meter, that means that I can port the drivers from the Android kernel to the Linux kernel, see if that works. If that works, I can just tell the kernel developers that, hey, this works, you should maybe just put that into mainline. So that's the general idea. Yeah. But another thing is that what I want to do is I want a good way to actually boot Android so that I can test all of this. I tried to set up um, I tried to set up systemd boot or gummy boot, gummy bot, <laughs> uh, and it doesn't seem like it can actually um, boot Android. It can, like, boot only things that are EFI um, executables on the EFI system partition. But Android requires you to actually load the kernel from the Android partition itself. And that's not something that Gumi Boot can do. 
So I need to change my bootloader. The obvious choice, of course, would be to use Grub2, because that's what Android x86 and uh, Remix OS already use. But that would be too simple. Why would we try to make our lives simple when we can make them complicated? So instead, let's go with Refind. That's another UEFI loader, which I've never used, but it sounds pretty cool. So let's just see what it does. Um, another thing that I want to do is to try and... Um, try to compile something that can actually read ebooks, so that I can actually use my tablet as, you know, a tablet. That would be nice. And... Lastly, uh, we installed Plasma Mobile last time. I didn't start it. Well, basically, installing the package adds two options to start Plasma in GDM, which I can then use, and that launches Plasma Active. But that's not Plasma Mobile, and it's abandoned, and it's terrible. For launching Plasma Mobile, there is another script to do that, and I think I downloaded that. Did I? Yeah. So there is another repository on KDE Quick Git that is like Plasma Phone Components, I think, and it includes this shell script, which is the key to actually starting Plasma Mobile. The thing is, I don't know whether it is enough to use this script to start it, or if I also have to have the whole Plasma phone components installed as well. But I guess we'll find out. So first things first, well, actually, first things first, tmux, and then, then I want to synchronize my portage tree sudo xsync, and once that's done, I can try and both update and install the two packages that I need, which is Refind and Ocular, which, surprisingly enough, I just found out that Ocular has a use flag that uh, sets whether it should be mobile or not. So that's pretty cool. I added mobile as a global use flag for my Gen2 configuration. And with the mobile flag enabled, it also pulls in Kirigami, which is pretty cool because the Kirigami is the framework that um, allows KDE applications to run both in mobile and in desktop mode, depending on what form factor the program is running in, without like doing it automatically, like, the programmers have to actually make two interfaces, one for mobile and one for um, desktop, so it's not suboptimal in any way. Um, but the framework does help in making that possible. So that's going to be pretty cool. And there we go. Uh, right, I also wonder... Uh, what's the command? GLSA check T all. I want to check if there have been any GLSAs issued since last update and whether I should update the whole thing in order to fix them. GLSAs are security announcements and they're very important to fix. T all means test the system against all of the known exploits. And if it is affected, then... Yeah, then I need to just update the world. Um, can I do everything in one command? Let's see. AVUD1 at world, oclar, refine. Will it actually merge Oclar and Refine? Yeah. 
yeah, Gen 2 is a complicated beast, but once I figure out how to actually have everything compiled, installed, and working, I can move on to other operating systems, such as, well, um, such as Chrome OS, for example, and Sailfish OS, which is basically what I wanted to do in the first place. I just need a good kernel that actually contains all of the functionality that I need, and then that will make it so that the operating systems that I want to install also work correctly. <laughs> of course, well, that will make it so that Linux works correctly as well, and I'd rather just use Linux rather than anything else, but at least Android is more touch-friendly, so it's kind of better to use on tablets, I guess. Sailfish OS is also pretty good, but there's fewer packages for it. And Chrome OS I've never used, so it will be interesting to just check it out. So my next priority is to get Plasma Mobile working so that I can write a review about that. How it feels, how it works, what's the status, things like that. And uh, yeah, so it really depends if that shell script is enough to launch it. If it's not enough to launch it, then I need to install the actual package that provides it. Which means I need to write an e-build for it, because as far as I can tell, it doesn't exist at the moment. And then if I write the e-build, I'll need to submit that to the Gen 2 bug tracker so that maybe they can put that inside the Gen 2 repository itself. We'll see. No, that's a lot of dependencies it's trying to calculate. Huh. Uh, no, it's not true that storage is mainly cloud-based. It's true only on Chromebooks, but that's because Chromebooks um, simply ship with, like, 60 gigabytes of disk space. So it's, like, not a whole lot of space that you can use. And Google then gives you Google Drive access, which has a lot more disk space. So that's why, like, if you have a Chromebook, chances are you're going to store things on the cloud instead of locally. But it's not like something that is built into Chrome OS itself. Actually, Chrome OS is based on Gen 2, which is odd, but it works. <laughs> Though lately it's kind of strange that... Well, I guess it also makes sense. Google is trying to move away from Chrome OS a bit. And they're trying to put Android on more devices rather than Chrome. So I'm not sure like how active the Chrome OS project is going to be. But well, Chrome itself is almost an operating system in and of itself anyway, so it's not like it takes a lot to actually like keep supporting it. Uh hi Zach. No, Plasma doesn't rely on systemd, and no, Gen2 does want everything to do with systemd. Gen2 is mostly about choice, and it has the choice to not use systemd, but also has the choice to use systemd, and really, using systemd is the only real way to use Gen2 as far as I'm concerned, because it makes everything that you do on Gen2 so much easier. You don't have to deal with shell scripts, you don't have to deal with run levels, system configuration, things like that. Like, you literally have to, well, you can literally skip two pages of the setup if you use systemd, because everything is auto-configured in systemd. And it's really nice that Gen2 supports systemd quite well, out of the box. The only problem is, like, the profile support, which Gen2 developers want to rework anyway. In that, like, there's a profile for Plasma, there's a profile for Systemd, there's a profile for 
X32, things like that, but they're not combinable with one another, and they should be. But apparently that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, there we go. Wow, that's what... What is going on here? Uh, right. What's this? Rebuilds, okay. Well, sure, there's a lot of Gen 2 developers who think that OpenRC is better, but it's really not. <laughs> but it's like an option there for people who are old school and don't want to learn anything new, basically. <laughs> Oh, right. There's an update to glibc. I need to check that. Um, I kept my OpenSUSE installation here kind of outdated a bit, so that Gentoo could catch up with it. And now I think Gentoo has a new, a newer version of glibc that is... and GCC also, yes. Um, and it's on par with what Tumbleweed had at the time, so then this CC will work better. So that's nice. So maybe I should just emerge those first, because otherwise this CC might get really, really confused. If, like, in the middle of everything I just change glibc and gcc versions. Yeah. And yes, I can install refine right off the bat. Nice. I already um, checked the use flags. And I'll need VTRFS support for Sailfish OS, so I'm enabling that already. X2 and X4 are enabled by default. The ISO 9660 support is for booting from, like, ISO files directly, which is an interesting thing that you can do in EFI. I don't really need it, but it doesn't add any extra dependencies anyway, so it's like, okay. And NTFS is needed for, of course, Windows. Yeah, indeed. The one thing that uh, I still miss in Gen 2 with regards to SystemD support is basically a good guide in their handbook. There is, like, one paragraph about it saying that, oh, if you're looking at SystemD, then you should go look at the wiki page for it. But it doesn't say that you can skip two pages of the handbook because you really don't need it. <laughs> uh, but it's a minor thing. But yeah, what you might have been thinking about actually is uh, GNOME. GNOME does require systemd, sort of. Like, it doesn't require systemd itself. It requires uh, login d. And at the moment, login d is only provided by systemd because People are lazy and don't want to create alternatives to it. Like, there was console kit that was sort of like an alternative to it, but it died and nobody wanted to look at the code at all. So, technically, GNOME doesn't require SMD, but there's nothing else that provides the needed functionality. <laughs> okay, so what am I looking at? Jig pack turbo file, bunch of Perl stuff, expat, open zip crypt. Oh, yeah, tough with JPEG is needed for Clar. Open J, lib zip. These are a bunch of things for Clar. Oh, yeah, Spinotail is also updated. Oh, 228. Okay, let me check what version I have installed here. Um, Zipper info Spinotails. Two twenty-eight, which is exactly what is going to be installed here. Yes, excellent. And what about glibc? Two twenty-five. Okay, let's check if glibc two twenty-five is available. 
bin utilis, bin lib, bin utilis libs, idn. Oh, new kernel sources. 411. Mm, no, I don't think I want to install a new kernel sources because I know they don't have all of the chair trail things that I get from the Linux Sunshine tree. So I'll need to match that again. Oh, new portage. That's the first thing I need to install. Huh, also an upgrade to Wayland. Nice. I see you, GNU TLS, pthread, fdev. Why do I even have fdev? What requires that? Hmm. Sound file. Oh, update to tmux. Hmm. DRAM, curl, spider monkey. Oh, really? Rebuilds for QT? Uh, this is going to take forever to compile. What can you do? Z sudo open this as age, huh? You can see that rolling releases really do roll quite fast. Lots of changes since last time. And yeah, I still have OpenRC here because OpenRC is part of at system. I can like manually remove it from at system and then I can purge it. But like that doesn't really do that much. I save a few kilobytes of space. If I just don't run OpenRC during boot, then I can just keep it around. There's a bug currently open on the Gentoo bug tracker, tracking when we can finally get rid of OpenRC from at system. Because there's been like some functions that Gentoo scripts rely upon, which historically have been part of the OpenRC package, but then when SMD came, they thought that, okay, maybe we should just split those into its own Gentoo functions package, which they did. And now everything should be using Gen2 functions instead of OpenRC. And then once that is done, then OpenRC can be dropped from that system. Okay, uh, what else? Mesa, really? New Mesa, 17 rather than 13. Huh. Not sure what this IMX is, but I'm pretty sure I don't have it. Maybe Poxy, Harfbuzz. Wow, new Xrog server. New revision of video intel. Huh, I should try and see if I can just use mode set instead of video intel. But all in due time. Oh, really? 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 WebKit GTK2 got an update. Why? This will take forever to install again. WP supplicant with QT5, GNOME shell also. Oh no, that's a rebuild. Okay, never mind. Yeah, Kirigami is the thing for mobile interfaces that scale correctly. And yes, Ocular. Okay, so first things first. Well, yeah, I can add this change to the config. So first things first, I want to uh, upgrade Portage. Because always update the updater. Yeah, and while that is happening, I can figure out the shell script for starting Plasma Mobile. This is how it looks like. Basically, it first and says some environment variables, then it exports a bunch of environment variables. Then it runs something. Yes, date.
Alright, and this is definitely not what I want because it says init dash dash user and it says upstart. <laughs> We're not using upstart. Upstart is completely dead at this point. You can tell that uh, Plasma Mobile hasn't been updated for like a year. Huh. And then there's a bunch of debug send magic. And then for some reason it plays a sound. And then it starts the authentication agent, and then it sound starts Power Devil. And finally it starts Plasma Shell. Saying that please launch the phone interface. So I want to edit this a bit. Basically try and make like a minimal version of this. Also, what is my path? Nothing in dot in particular. Oh, wait, really? I have GCC of three? Uh, GCC config. List. Huh, yeah, I have GCC 630. Is that the same version I have on OpenSUSE? Yes. Well, on OpenSUSE I have 631, but that's not a big deal. Okay, so then binu utils. Ah, oh, there we go. Done upgrading portage. Let's see that I have is yes, 225, and it's still hard masked. So yeah, that's a bit strange, though. Wasn't it mentioned up there as something that gets updated? I don't see any new version of it. Hmm. Okay, so then just update the utils. Okay, so my path is user local bin. I don't have anything in my home directory as a part of the path. So basically I want to edit it first and then move it to user local bin. So these unsets are fine. Let's see, do these exports make sense? QPE platform Wayland, absolutely. Platform theme KDE, absolutely. Disable window decoration makes sense for phones. Current desktop KDE makes sense. K screen back and Q screen makes sense. Full session one, session version five. Platform phone handheld. I wish there was a tablet option, but let's go with phone first and then figure out if there is a tablet version. I don't think there is, but who knows. QT quick control style plasma looks okay. Grid unit in pixels. That's probably quite important for scaling, so in case the scaling is off, I can change this. Number of modems equals one. How about zero? Yeah, let's comment this out. QT quick controls mobile, true. And K 
case sync debus environment. Do I have that? Case sync debus environment. Case sync. Hmm. It does say something about CMake install full. Oh, right. Uh, I took this from the source code repository, so normally CMake would expand this into libexec there. And I don't have path in libexec? No. Uh, okay, so how is it called again? K sync dbus env. User libexec k sync. Nope, I don't have anything with ksy at all. So for now, comment this out. Definitely comment this out. Not sure about these debus things. Well, this requires telepathy mission control. Not sure why it really starts here. It also says that this should all start with required, but so maybe it was fixed in the meanwhile. So let's just comment this out for now. Don't need any of these. And libexec pocket kd authentication agent. Polkit. I don't have anything of that matter either. Hmm. Okay, comment this out. Org KDE power double. Something tells me I don't have that either. Do I have anything in loop exec? Yes. Maybe it's like a different directory, like libexec slash kde or something. Maybe I should try to install that package after all. Well, all in due time. Then exec plasma shell p or kde plasma phone. Yeah, that looks fine. So I think this is enough to try and start things. And it gives a log in TMP plasma shell logs. Okay. sudo mv phone to user local bin. And once that's done, let's see. mod plus x user local bin plasma phone all right so i can either try to launch it from here or i can try to do that physically on the tablet let's first try to launch it from here Not sure if anything happened. Let me check. Well, I'm still not sure if something happened, but I'm guessing that no, because I had GDM running. Of course, I can't have two things running graphically at the same time. Let's see. Do I have the TMP plasma shell logs? I have the create display. No such file or directory. Yeah, so let's first just 
System CTL stop display manager. Yes, that stopped. Good. Mm, okay, that didn't seem to do anything, so let me do that physically on the tablet. Switch to virtual terminal one. And plasma phone. Still nothing happened. No such file or directory. What part of the script? Oops. A part of the script gives that sort of response, I wonder. User bin. Oh. Probably exec. There's probably no plasma shell. Uh, there is plasma shell. Plasma shell is user bin plasma shell. Yeah, I see you. Then what is not found? It says display not found. But also, why does it try to start Plasma Shell rather than trying to start KWIN Wayland? Okay, let me just do this manually, see if I can debug something out of that. Basically, I need to comment out the last line. And then I can source it. Check. Did sourcing it work? KDE full session, for example. Okay, that says one. And something related to phone, plasma platform. Yes, phone handheld. Okay. So let's see. What if I do plasma shell dash p org e plasma phone? Fail to create display, no such file or directory. So, same thing. What if I just start Plasma Shell? Still same thing. Curious. Hi, Agent S. We're installing, well, trying to set up Plasma Mobile on a tablet device. And Plasma Mobile is very experimental software, so it's a whole lot of compilations and trying to figure out how to make things work. <laughs> how does Start KDE work, I wonder? Start KDE. 
Okay, start KDE is a shell script at the moment. KDE were looking at replacing their start KDE shell script with um, with systemd user instance. And they actually ported over a lot of the functionality into systemd user instance. And then it kind of stagnated and then people forgot about it and yeah, I still want to try and see if it works still to this day. I know it's not maintained anymore, but maybe they just need a reminder or something. Okay, so how do I start Plasma? Code. DG data there's QD bus if QD bus. So the question is is QD bus running? Because I think that was the original problem that it wasn't running, but I think it is running now. QD bus. QD bus is QD bus. Okay. <laughs> and then it exports KDE full session true. KDE full session. Oh. It's done with the new titles. Now, do I have this CC enabled? Yes, good. All right, so now I can finish installing everything and updating everything. Hopefully. Okay, so KDE sets KDE full session to true. Even though this says KDE full session to one. I guess that doesn't matter, but still, that's weird. KDE session version to five, yeah. Export root, KDE session version, session version. Export KDE session UID, export SDG current desktop. Yes, that was also set. All environment variables are set, sent to dbus. dbus update activation environments, systemd all. Okay, splash, key okay, init. The only thing that is mobile specific in the script here is the Plasma platform, I think. Maybe the case screen backend. None of these are overwritten by the start KDE script, so I think I can just use the start KDE script and that should start Plasma Mobile for me. I hope.
Let's check. Plasma platform. Yeah. Not said here. Okay, screen backend. Not set here. Excellent. But what does it do? Like, it does a whole bunch of things with QD bus. Then there's KDEWM. Okay, so if I set KDEWM, then that's the window manager that gets started. And it's not set here to anything. No. I think that's the main way to tell it to start in Wayland mode with, uh, versus telling it to start in X mode. And I think by default it starts in X mode. So let me just run start KDE. See what happens. Display is not set or cannot connect to the X server. Okay. Then set KDEWM. Oh. KWIN Wayland. Display is not set or cannot connect to the X server. I don't want you to connect to the X server. Alright, so basically I just need to figure out how to convince it to run Wayland. I mean, the Qt QPA platform is really what should run Wayland. So if I just run KWIN Wayland, what will happen? Well, a bunch of things happened. Something flashed, and then I got back to the command line, and there's some debugging output. So basically, I just need to output that into a file. No backend specified through command line arguments, trying auto resolution. Failed to register, global Excel, couldn't start K global Excel. Failed to connect to the K global Excel daemon. Creating connection to X server failed. But it's K when Wayland, you're not supposed to need the X server. Arg. <laughs> okay, I probably need to read some more about it because the maintainer of KWIN did make a blog post talking about common issues starting KWIN Wayland. And yeah, let's also make sure that... Like, what is going on here? 224R3 in the slot 2.2 installed instead of 224R1 in slot 22. Okay. 
Yeah, so basically it's just that I have an old version that was dropped from the tree altogether. Yeah, that makes sense. Firmware refined file. Oh yeah, I need to mask Gen 2 sources. What was it again? Package accept keywords. And here I unmasked sources. No, yes, right there. Yeah, so I need to come in this part out. Okay, what else? Expat, Jeep, Crypt, Tiff, Jade, Util, Slibs. Huh. What causes a rebuild for that? Huh. Doesn't say. And yeah, a bunch of QT stuff. Evoke, okay, Xiv, so Z Studio, Open Sage, Open RC, Elsa, Mesa, Quero, Half Buzz, Intel Poplar, Cups Filters, Game Shell. So bin utils libs. Oh, it's what is causing the rebuilds, okay. So first no. Then update GLPC. This is a pretty important update because of some exploit that happened that was discovered recently with heap and stack collisions. I don't really know what's that about, but somehow it enables a process to get access to memory of another process, and that's pretty bad. <laughs> and that's why there was a GLSA security advisory for it. Yeah, so first of all, let's see if I can find out where that blog was. Um, he is called Martin Greslin. Does this blog thing have a list of all the things that were blogged? Doesn't look like it. There are archives though. And there are categories. But they don't seem to be very interesting. Oh, in well, the connection somehow got interrupted here. But now it should be back. I hope it's back. Also, refresh my chat just to be sure.
number 16. From window killing to screenshot. Not this. October 16. We'll end improvements. Streams, TCOM, Wayland by default. Still can't find that. Ah, there we go. Why does K Win Wayland not start? Okay, so. Does Nesta sit up? Okay, fine. Let's try a nested setup. So first start X. For that I need to start GDM again. select whatever plasma I can actually get and log in. I have two plasmas so I don't know which one I will get. Looks like something is starting up. I got Plasma active. Uh, I don't have console here. Oh, but I have the GNOME terminal. Yes, I have a terminal. Excellent. That's all I need. But first, I need to make sure that it starts emerging things that should be emerging. to emerge glibc with deep so it actually emerges the whole world don't want that yet come on i will want that but just not yet i just want glibc itself it will cause a bunch of rebuilds but that is fine hmm. so i wonder how that is handled like, will it cause a rebuild for the whole system? Because if something is linking... Well, yeah. If something is linking dynamically against glibc, then of course there is no problem. But if it is linking statically to glibc, then obviously you want to recompile it. 
otherwise the exploit will still be there, and that's definitely what you want to avoid. And it doesn't cause any rebuilds, that's... Alright, because it's been util slips that is causing rebuilds, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so let's try and start Wayland inside X. The command is K1 underscore Wayland space dash dash X Wayland. KD Wayland Composter, Wayland Zero, press right control key to grab input. That certainly works. If it works, you can send Windows there. K okay, right platform Wayland. Do I have any way of doing that? I don't think so. I do get a bunch of debugging output. K1 Wayland. No backend specified through command line argument, trying auto resolution. Failed to register surface, K Global Excel. Intel Open Source Technology Center, Cherry Trail, Mesa. Intel Unknown 3.0. Mesa. Kernel 4.12, gel cell shaders, yes, texture and pot support, yes, virtual machine, no, of course, strict binding, no, circuitry listener failed, already running, glamour EGL, well, there's a bunch of warnings, but it's not anything too difficult to deal with. Um, okay. So can I start GNOME Terminal like this? Dash dash platform Wayland. I don't think I can. Yeah, exactly, I can't. I can only start KDE applications like this, and I don't have a single one installed. I could do that with Ocular, but I don't have it installed. <laughs> but whatever, so k one actually starts, so that's good. server. Well, everything works, so let's just give it this for now. And I don't have any way to put an application into the K Wayland window for now. So let's just close it for now. And log out. Log out. Great, back to GDM. Let's disable GDM. Hmm, okay. So it says that I actually need to launch some sort of program so that it can actually run it and not just 
be a blank screen with nothing to do. That does actually make a lot of sense. So, stop display manager. First things first. You're not doing a good job stopping the display manager. No, seriously, what? Well, that is strange. Because it's definitely there. There's also GNOME Shell there for some reason. Why would GDM star GNOME Shell? That makes so little sense. But wait, there's no actual process called GDM. I guess GNOME Shell is GDM itself somehow? Well, it's still to go away, I guess. Let's be nice first. Yes. That killed GDM. Great. So, okay, first things first. Dbus. Well, I have that already. Echo. Qt. QPA platform. Wayland. Yes, that's what I need. So KWIN Wayland dash dash X Wayland dash dash exit with session equals GNOME terminal. Nope, still the same thing. It... The screen does become black. I get the mouse cursor in the center of the screen. But I don't get anything else afterwards. I might need to try it with a QT application. Do I have any QT applications installed? Uh, clean QT GUI five. Don't see any extra errors that I didn't see back when starting it from 
X itself. But it does say could not find any platform plugin. also gets an error from GNOME Terminal, saying that Wayland Compositor does not support XDG shell interface, not using Wayland display. And then it says the X11 connection broke, error 1. Did the X11 server die? Hmm. Yeah, so that would explain it, like, I don't have... a QT program running. GDK programs... decline to run... because they're very unreasonable, and they require a stable interface, or something like that. So... have anything here. Oh, I have a designer. That might be enough. They're all frameworks, so this is not launchable. Oh, I have KC's guard. Excellent. Most excellent. Yes. It works. I got KC's guard. I can press things. It feels like the thing needs calibration though. That's a bit strange, because I can interact with the uh, window decorations just fine. But inside the window? Something weird is going on. Like, I need to press just slightly above. But at least it runs, so... That's good to know. So basically, as far as Kwin Wayland is concerned, it's working just perfectly. If that works, you're ready to run Start Plasma Compositor, so maybe that's what I need to do. Let's try it. Start Plasma Compositor. Oh. Debus got killed. Huh. Huh. 
export dollar sign debuff launch Well, I'm seeing something. I am seeing the splash screen of KDE. Not seeing anything else. Oh. Okay, now I can see Plasma active. On Wayland? And everything is pretty large. Which is nice, actually. I can interact with desktops activities I can add activities I can filter yeah nice everything is scaled up to 1.5 which is just what I need so it's by default that is really incredible I can also edit activities change the names, add custom wallpaper. Still there's this weird offset going on for all of the clicks. Oh, nice, I can scroll the screen contents around. Okay, so this is nice, so I got Plasma Active working, but that's still not Plasma Mobile. So I'm pretty certain... I should probably log out. I'm pretty certain... that... There you go. that all that I need to make this work is indeed to install Plasma Phone components. No. Huh? Why does Locale Gen need updating? I don't think it does. Probably just because it's restored the original. Yeah. So zap it. Okay, now I can update everything. Meanwhile, so my next thing to do is to create the new e-build. So let's go and do that. User local portage KD Plasma sudo make directory need to copy the exact name Should put this into my bookmarks. Okay. Someone just commented on my mobile OS comparison part 4 GNOME asking if I tested Plasma, which I'm doing right now!
What's the URL for this? Uh, ah, there we go. So we got that, and what else do I want? All right, I'm creating a new e-build. I need to get the name of the repository. So quigget.kde.org. What I need is plasma phone components. Yes. So let's call it that. Plasma phone components. And then I just need to copy my other e-build. Pseudo copy plasma mobile, plasma mobile 999 to plasma phone components as plasma phone components 9999 dot e-build. And okay, so the next thing I would need to do is to basically transfer over the meaning of the CMake headers to the eBuild. It's not very complicated. So first it says CMake minimum required version 2812. So that means it requires at least that CMake version. So where is CMake? CMake. 3.7.2. Anything else is not in the tree anymore, so I don't actually need to do anything about it. It cannot possibly have a too old CMake version. And there's a bunch of things that already require CMake anyway. QT minimum five two. I think that's fine as well. Okay, a five minimum is five zero zero. Well, since they are saying so, let's put it like that. Plus and minimal. I don't think I need plus and minimal, but I'll keep it as it is for now. Automark, include current there. Find package ECM. I don't know what that is. And it requires a bunch of those. ECM install icons, ECM setup version. Hmm. Well, let's just try without it for now. Okay, then it requires KD install dirs, KD CMake settings, compiler settings. But that's all included in inherit KD5 already, so I don't need to care about that. QD5, KF5. It requires KF5 components plasma, service declarative, internationalization, KIO, and people. So what's. Start. Do 
by commenting things out, but I cannot really comment things out while they are inside of a variable. At least I don't think I can. Does this show it like this? But I'm pretty sure it won't accept it. So let's do it like this. I do know that I need QT core and stuff. So I'll just put this here. And then I can comment these out. Oh done calculating things, so yes, please emerge everything. Okay, so let's start from the top. Plasma is the first thing that it requires, which means it's this thing. Yes, that. Next. Service. Case service. Next. Declarative. K declarative. Next, internationalization. Ah, uh, well, actually. Service should be at the bottom. Declarative should be up there. Plasma should be at the very bottom. So I'm doing this in the complete opposite way. Okay, internationalization is after declarative, so at least that's not going to waste. Gen2 developers are pretty strict about this. They want everything to be ordered in alphabetical order, even though it literally doesn't matter. Okay, what's next? KIO. That's after internationalization. Next, people. What? Okay. I didn't know this existed. people. Next. Plasma quick. I think it's part of a declarative at the moment. Let me check to make sure. Quick controls is not that because that's a framework. Yeah, it's not there. So I don't need to care about it. Hmm. 
Next, debus add-ons. There's core add-ons, but I need debus add-ons. Ah, K debus add-ons. Oh no. Put this where it needs to be. K debus. It's at the very top. And notifications. K notifications. And it requires telepathy QT5. second. All right, so what do they mean by telepathy QT5? And it says required, so I cannot really say that it's optional or something. Also requires QT5 Wayland, but it says QT5, not KF5. So is it netlibs telepathy QT? Might be. Or is it KTP itself? Wait, I'm somewhere else. <laughs> telepathy. Yeah, that's KTP, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't require the whole meta package. Telepathy connection managers, telepathy logger, telepathy mission control, telepathy idle, telepathy account sign on, telepathy force stream, glib. So I guess it means netlibs telepathy QT with QT5. slash telepathy QT with QT5, something like that. I don't remember if that's how you write required uh, US flags, but something like that. What's next? K 
Tier 5 Wayland. So it's K Wayland. Right after K Service. That seems to be everything. Yeah, that seems everything. Doesn't use blue anywhere. So, I don't need this whole semantic desktop thing. Keep those around for the time being. And I think I can just comment out the whole thing here. Okay, that should be good. Let's try it out. Actually, uh, Repo Man might not like this while I'm emerging stuff, but let's try it anyway. Should be able to make a manifest though. Yeah. Repo Man says everything is fine enough. That means we can actually emerge it. If it says fatal, that means... Well, no, that's, that's not actually fatal. Come on now. Use this blank line. I'll fix that later. But if all it's missing is metadata, then that's fine. So currently it's emerging Pearl. Did it already emerge? Refined. Now let's find out. Type refined. X refined. Q list refined. Okay. Looks like it is installed. Refine install, okay. So let's do that. Well, that's a lot of keys that it has. But I don't use secure boot, so I don't care. And these are all the drivers, BDRFS and TFS, X2, ISO, X4, images, fonts, icons. Ah, huh, what kind of icons does it have? CentOS, Windows 8, Debian, Fedora, Slackware, SUSIM, Mandriva, 
Kubuntu, Windows, Haiku, <laughs> NetBSD. Does it have Gentoo? Chakra, Magia. Yes, it does have Gentoo. No, oh, it even has Chrome OS. Does it have Android? That would be really cool. It has Mac. No, I might need to find an Android icon myself. No, no Android. All right, so let's uh, look at the at the documentation about how to use Refind. So first place to look f for the uh, information is to go to wiki.gentoo.org. Refined Installation Well, first things first, I need to uninstall Gumi Boot oh, Also, before I forget First things first, mount boot. Without that, I cannot do anything. Okay, so it knows that the firmware is UFI 2.40 by American Megatrends 5.11. And surprisingly, my UFI is quite compliant. If I remove the bootx64.efi file... What does it exist, though? But if I remove it, um, it still boots to... Gumi boot, I think... At least it should. Hmm. I'm not sure why there's the boot x64 TFI. I'm pretty sure I removed it. Well, whatever. I will remove it now, anyway. So, remove. Boot steel is still pretty useful because it lists everything that is actually set to boot. So now we have Yeah, only Microsoft's bootloader, which is ID one, which is great because we can put our bootloader into ID zero. Next We have the loader there. This would be boot not installed into ESP. Yeah, I did move it out. That's weird. So let's remove this, and let's remove this. There we go. No default bootloader installed in ESP. Yeah, that's what I saw last time. Not sure how it appeared, but yeah.
Okay, so let's go. That's still already fine. Use command refind install to install the binaries into your EFI system partition. Oh, nice. So refine install actually mounts boot. Install stuff. Calls FE boot manager to install itself. Okay, great. So basically it's zero configuration. Just refine install and everything should go fine. Sudo no. Sudo refined install. Shim source is none. Installing refined on Linux. ESP is found at slash boot using VFAT. Copy the binary files, copying sample configuration file. Edit this file to configure refined. Installing it. Why were there problems running FE Boot Manager? Well, let's look at what we have. sudo fboot boot mgr dash v. Yeah, that is weird. Let's manually run it then. The Gentoo wiki is not good enough for that sort of thing. I need to look at the Arch wiki. Manual installation. Have a boot manager. Okay, so it says that this is what I need. If boot manager create disk Okay, first things first. Do I actually have this? Yes, good. Second of all, what is it called? Slash boot is um, CBLK0P1. Oh, that makes sense. Dev CBLK0. Part one. Pseudo, of course. And yes, it sent boot zero 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 zero. Just to verify, refine boot manager at zero, boot order zero, refine refine x sixty four dot efi. Excellent, that should work. Hopefully this will work. Now I need to configure it. CD slash boot. What did it say? Oh, it's just boot refined linux.com. Huh.
You know, that's one way to do it. Not exactly what I want, but I'll keep this by default for now. And the biggest question is how can I make it boot Android? That's the main thing here. Configuration. Okay, so there is something called mkrlconf. That's weird, but okay. So it's an F refine refine conf. Yeah, what's tools? Nothing. There we go. Configuration file for the refine boot menu. Time out. Screen saver. Yeah, disable screen saver. That's a silly thing. Like the idea is okay. Like you want to save your battery life, probably. So, make the screen turn off is something that would save your battery life. Making the screen black doesn't actually save your battery life because it's still black. Well, it does save it a bit, but really not significantly. Cons. Hmm. Why would you ever use BMP images?
The problem with UEFI in general is that it really has no idea about the correct screen size. You get the UEFI frame buffer, which is of the wrong size. And you can't really do anything about it unless you know how to mode set, which at boot you don't, because you would have to have drivers for that. So it's suboptimal always. It's a bit strange, why can't they just make the UFI frame buffer of the right size? At this day and age it sounds like something that would be done fairly easily, I guess, as a standard practice. Oh well. Graphics mode. Hmm. That sounds intriguing. That's interesting. If there is a text mode that is of native resolution, that could be interesting to use. But it's text mode still, so I'm not sure how useful that is. Oh, video resolution. Hmm, okay. This of support modes. That's nice. I'm pretty sure there is no good support mode. But I can try entering something here and see what comes up. As it says, resolution of 1024 usually works, but higher values often don't. Which is the whole problem. I wonder if there is any hardware that actually sets the correct resolution. And it's like, there are only a few resolutions that actually matter. Why can't you make frame buffers of that size? It's not... Not rocket science, I think. <laughs> So my resolution is uh, one to eighty by eight hundred or something. Hmm. 
Yeah, it's not 720. It's slightly higher. Yeah, it is 800, I'm pretty sure. Ooh, that screen support, eh? I do have that. And my UEFI configuration screen also has that, so I can enable touch. Cool. Okay. Oh, so I can install Memtest. And it will show up. That's pretty cool. Hmm. Windows recovery. <laughs> That's also funny. Okay, fair enough. Sounds pretty cool. I don't think I have that. Yeah, I know that there is an EFI driver for F2FS currently in development. Originally, I wanted to format my Android installations as F2FS because Android has support for that. Unfortunately, the installer doesn't like that. So for now, I'm just using X4 for it. But it's fine, as far as I'm concerned, at the moment, so I won't mess around with that. Okay. That also sounds pretty cool. And the default is internal, external, optical, manual. 
Okay, because bios-based things don't really matter. And netboot is experimental, so that's why it's not there. Makes sense. Manualist enable as well, that's great. Something to use if debugging is necessary, I suppose. No, I don't need this. All my discs are actually multimedia cards. I might want this. But I need to know how the my volume thing works. Here it shows ESP2, but I don't know what that is all about. I need a way to say that please look into this partition. And maybe there's some more information about that down below. Oh, okay, so this applies to all volumes. So actually, I want to do this. And enter React OS and Android x86. Not sure what the uh, capitals are, so I'll need to check that. I never understood this whole reverse um, DNS thing way to write the names of things which is like the reverse of boot.recovery.apple.com Does it stem from Apple and it's popular just because Apple is popular? Why not just, you know 
Just say boot recovery, not apple.com. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it doesn't have dot EFI, so I do want this to be on. No. Don't fold it yet. I will want to do that later on, but not so far. Still have dollar topic and things like that.
this is pretty hilarious. Here. Mm, don't care. Don't care. Mm, okay, cool. And manual stanzas. There we go. I'll need to do this for Android kernels, but I first need to see how it works with the defaults, because maybe I don't need to enter any of these. I'm pretty sure I do need, though, because there's a bunch of options. Well, I could just put the options in a file inside Android partition. Yeah, actually, I'll try that, hmm. because that's pretty easy. Disabled so that they don't actually appear. Interesting that their file system labels are actually the same as in the UEFI shell. That's very nice. It's basically following through the UEFI standard. Which like isn't that good, but it's still better to be consistent rather than invent your own thing, like Grub does all the time. Yeah, so I don't think I need anything except to make sure that I'm looking at the right directory. Um, so let's try and mount something to figure out which is which. Do I have something here already? I have Remix OS here. What? Why did it have a star next to it? That's weird. But yeah, I don't need this, basically. And then... still has stuff, but 
like I don't care. It can stay as it is. Uh, what I do want is to Yes, that's actually what I want. I want to look at the Remix OS one. Okay, so it is slash Remix OS. And it's called kernel. Initered is initered. And it is BLK 0p4. Great. So how does this work? So name, options. But what about initered and what about the name of the kernel? Okay, so initered equals. Relative to the root of the file system. Okay. So it's P4. Here I just need to make a refine linux.conf. No. That's the grub configuration for this. That's different from what I was using, right? Yeah, this Android boot cell Linux thing is not there. Well, I'm quite confused. But let's just try this then. So Nitrid is Remix OS Nitrid. This is what I need. Right, refined. Linux.conf. So that will be Android Remix OS.
regular. Nitrid equals slash remix os slash nitrid.img. Yes. Not sure about all the other things, but okay. That should be fine. At least it should show something. And I also want to mount Android x86. Huh, so that's how it's called. Yeah, so basically the same thing. I need to copy this, okay. Uh, boot. Refined, uh, refined dot conf. Nitrid slash Android six zero R three or something like that slash initer dot ng. Six zero R three, yes. Nitrid dot ng. Yes, I think. I'm not sure how it knows to launch RAM disk. Hmm. But I guess we'll see. Okay. That's nice. Got everything done here. Now then, while things are emerging, still only halfway there, and the um, webkit things will take forever. So in the meanwhile, I can try to uh, compile another kernel, I guess. As long as I have enough space. Uh, disk free. Ew. So the answer is not really.
Yeah, I can't risk it because this will cause problems for the compilation. While we're at it, let's find how to clean the dist files directory of Gen 2 because that takes up a whole lot of space. Local dist files cache. Not quite what I'm looking for. Well, that's interesting. There's a knowledge base article saying that the destination directory location holds all the source code archives downloaded by the system. Unless the files are properly removed when no longer needed, the storage occupied by this location will continue to grow. Regular cleanup of this location is not performed automatically by Portage. Uh, why? <laughs> that sounds really dumb. Maybe I should clean these sort of things from my server as well. It's been quite a long time. I downloaded a lot of things. So it's probably taking up a lot of space very much necessarily. Toolkit has eclean dust. Hmm, interesting. So it removes all of the things that are not attached to any installed e build. But the thing is, I probably can't run it while Portage is doing stuff. Because if I try to do that, it will delete the just recently downloaded uh, files. And then Portage will become very confused as to why the files it just downloaded are not there anymore. So I have to wait for Portage to stop doing stuff before I can run it. Oh, by default it removes everything which does not belong to e-builds which are no longer in a tree. Whereas the deep option removes everything that's not installed. Which is the only sensible thing. Like, why would you ever not use deep? Okay, so while we're at it, let me just check my server, because this is a bit alarming.
Okay, my server's using up 100 gigabytes of space. That's not too bad. This file sticks up three gigabytes. That's also not too bad. E clean dust. Let's run it anyway and see what happens. And it cleans two gigabytes of space. do I make it clean deeper? Because I don't need the dust files at all. Probably I should ask on the Gen 2 IRC. Okay, so it says, look at Manny clean.
Well, the manual page doesn't really say anything interesting. So I do need to ask people on the Gen 2 RC channel. Okay, so they, they just say user M. <laughs> no big deal. So what is it doing now? Something. QT something something. QT core, I guess. So I was wondering, maybe I should try to do something with the kernel? Like, I've found that basically there are 
a few tablets out there that are not HP X2210 that have almost literally the same ASPI tables as the HP X2210, which means they are literally HP X2210. But they're running Android by default. Which means that as long as I would have access to their Android sources, which I should have because GPL requires one to have access to those sources, and if the battery and everything else runs correctly, I should be able to port that into an actual kernel release so that I can use it with my main Linux version. The problem is, as far as I can tell, they did not release the kernel sources, which means they're in violation of the GPL and their permission to use the Linux kernel is revoked within a week. Um, but they don't care, of course. Too bad. Um, but there are other kernels that are kind of meant for people to run other things on those tablets that are not the default Android. And they do include some cherry trail things, including something that looks quite like the battery that I am looking for. I was hoping that the kernel that we installed last time, which was the Dollar Cove um, topic kernel, that it would have the ability to actually show the battery, but turns out it doesn't. Oh, actually, one thing to check. Yeah, I need to also install ASPI because it's basically LSPCI except with ASPI. <laughs> uh, let's do a quick check. Do I need anything for it? I think I don't. Yeah, I don't need anything for it. But I need to finish waiting for things to install. And there's QT core update. Huh. Yeah, but with the amount of disk space that I have, it's not really doable to try and do anything with the kernel sources, because even though there is code for, like, a particular battery, which also has the associated ASPI entries and so on, so it should work, it is very likely to depend on something else. And also integrated the help text and things like that is going to be difficult. So I'd rather just compile an Android kernel. I know that Android doesn't usually work with a mainline Linux kernel, but I think a Linux distribution can be run with a kernel that has the Android additions in it. So I should be able to test if it works or not. Yeah, and also... Oh yeah, um... SOC button array is the thing that allows using the volume up and volume down buttons. And we do have like a bunch of modules for um, camera devices. GC2235 is the camera. XCON is also something that is related to something. Buttons maybe? 
maybe cameras or maybe in general. Basically, in the ASPI tables there's something called INT3496 and the driver for that is XCON Intel INT3496, so I made that into a module. Might as well build it into the kernel now that I know that it's getting loaded. And also much of the other things. I eventually want to make the Linux kernel self-contained as much as I can. Aside from the Intel drivers, I think. And the Wi-Fi drivers, well, yeah. I probably want them to be built in as well. I don't know how it really works in Android, but if I build everything into the kernel binary itself, and I just let it run Android, it should technically work. Since it is self-contained. Skylake and Kaby Lake processors have broken hyperthreading. I don't have any such hardware though. Model 76. Uh huh. Skylake is model 78. Do I have microcode in general somewhere? Firmware should have it. Hmm, there's a Wicca article on Intel Microcode. The wicket does say that you have to actually merge Intel microcode.
Well, there certainly is a microcode update driver, but it's not doing anything at all. Okay, so it's in live firmware Intel U code. That's just Intel, not Intel U code. Okay. Look at that, it's the SSD firmware.
Okay, so basically just emerging Intel microcode should load it, even though not early in the boot. If we're loading it very early in the boot, you would have to also just put it inside the kernel itself. Makes sense. Though it's also interesting, are there any updates to the UEFI for this? Nope, latest update September 1, 2016. And I have firmware newer than that, which is kind of hilarious. Yeah, and just the initial release, so. Nothing new for this. Well, that means there's nothing else to do at the moment. But to wait for Portage to finish what it's doing. And it will still take a while because Qt WebKit, or GTK WebKit, some WebKit anyway. And I also will need to clean up Firefox because that's not useful at all. So I guess I'll just see you all next time, or whenever that will be. Probably somewhat soon, because I'm not done doing things that I wanted to do. And yeah, then we'll find out whether our new e-build works correctly, and whether Plasma Mobile actually works, and whether I can boot into Android, and whether I can finally finish uh, setting up the kernel in a way that it detects my battery. So I will see you all then. Later.